Hey, welcome to Bethel Online. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're watching us today, it's by no accident. We believe that God has something just for you. Here at Bethel, we believe that when real people, people like you and me, encounter the real Jesus, real change happens. So our hope and prayer for you is that you have an encounter with Jesus today. We also believe that God has a next step for all of us to take. Today, your step may just be watching this week's message. It could be asking God to forgive you and finally putting your hope and trust and faith in Jesus for the first time. Maybe it's being baptized or beginning to read through the Bible, whatever it is. We want to help you take that next step. You can let us know what step you're taking by texting the word online to 765-433-2004. We would love to walk with you. During this season, God is teaching us to be flexible. It seems like every week there's a new challenge and more and more changes. A great way to stay up to date on all the changes that's happening at Bethel is to follow us on social media. It's also a great way to listen to current and past Sunday morning messages. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Instagram. You can find us on all these platforms by searching Bethel Putco. Well, thanks again for tuning in online today. We know, we want you to know that you are wanted you are welcomed here, and that you are loved. I hope you have a great day. God bless. Good morning, Bethel. I'm so glad you joined us this morning for our first Sunday in a series called Ghosted. When I was a kid, I used to hear pastors talk about God and Jesus. And when I was in church as a kid, they would say the Father, meaning God, the Son, meaning Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And we refer to the Holy Spirit, and many have historically referred to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost. But I don't know about you, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit and it comes to my ideas around God and relationship, the Holy Spirit can be kind of shrouded with some confusion. Um, maybe you've gone to a really charismatic church where people equated the Holy Spirit with getting really emotionally worked up and, and, and physically reactive to whatever was happening in the room. Or, or maybe you've had somebody in your life who's like, man, I got chills and that, that's the Holy Spirit. But the problem for me is, Sometimes I get goosebumps when I have to go to the bathroom. So it's kind of confusing for me because when I, when I listen to people's experience of the Holy Spirit, sometimes I'm a little confused. I, I may have felt the presence of God in a moment instructing me or feeling like God was telling me to do something, and I might equate that to the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is a part of what God offers those who follow Him that God offers to allow the Holy Spirit to live within us. And in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was present, but the Spirit of God could come and go from people. But once Jesus died on the cross, raised from the dead, he said he was sending one who would be the teacher to walk with us. And so that's the promise of a follower in Christ is a life with the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought of a particular historical moment and thought, I wish I was there? Like it would make it so much easier for my walk of faith if I was there and I saw that. Like for me, there are a couple moments in scripture that I think about. I mean, there are lots of cool moments. I mean, Jesus heals people. Like there, there are moments where like a blind man who's never seen sees for the first time. And honestly, I'd love to be there. I'd love to see the reaction on that man's face when he took on the light where his world had been dark. And there, there are stories of people who couldn't hear, who began to hear, where um, a world of silence became noise because of the miraculous action of God. I'd love to see, I'd love to be there in that moment. But there are a couple moments in Scripture, if you made me pick just two, that I'd love to have been there in the moment. I mean, I'd love to be in the room when that event happened. And one is the moment of the resurrection, like when the ladies go to find Jesus and they find that he's not there and they come to the conclusion that Jesus 
is alive. I mean, you've never seen a dead person come back to life, but on Friday, Jesus was dead and then he was alive. And I just think it would alter our entire life if we saw that moment where Jesus, Jesus who was beaten and killed on the cross for the sins of all humanity, the one with whom no one had hope on Friday brought hope to the entire world on Sunday when he had risen from the dead. I mean, the resurrection would be an incredible thing to witness. And, and honestly, the resurrection of Jesus spurned so many people to so many great things and great works. But there's another moment that I want to talk about today a little bit. It's a moment that religious people often refer to as Pentecost. It's the moment where the Holy Spirit after Jesus died and rose from the dead, he told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would come upon them, that they needed to wait for the Holy Spirit. And I can only imagine there was a period of time where the waiting was kind of difficult, where they wondered if this was going to happen, but they had wondered if Jesus would raise from the dead too, and he had, and so they, they waited out of obedience. And then the scripture in Acts chapter 2 tells the story of the Holy Spirit coming. And I would love to have been in that room when the Holy Spirit showed its presence to the followers of Jesus. Acts chapter 2 tells the story. It says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. My friends, that in itself is a gigantic miracle. When you see that it says all the believers were doing something, we, we live in a world where there are lots of people who believe in God, but they can't seem to do anything together. But they were all meeting together in one place. And what was it that they were believing in? They were believing in the resurrection of Jesus. They were all united in the fact that they believed Jesus had died on Friday, but then been alive on Monday or Sunday. And they believed that was true. It says suddenly... There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. Like they describe it in a way that mortal people could understand. And it filled the house where they were sitting. That it just filled up the room where it happened. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in each other's languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. All of the sudden, the presence of God descends on the room in a powerful way, and they were able to do what they could not before. I'd love to be in the room where it happened. I'd love to understand or comprehend what it meant for the presence of the Holy Spirit in the purest form revealed itself to these people who believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. And I wonder what the power would be in our day if all the believers gathered together and experienced the presence of God in this powerful way. And I actually believe that it's possible for those who have trusted and believed in Jesus to unite together to experience God in this powerful way. As I look at this passage, I see some things that stand out to me. Some things about this moment that I think are unique and amazing and incredible. First is unity. I don't think there's ever been a more politically divisive time in our history the one that you and I know as people living in America and honestly people in the church. I mean, our entire culture has been divided over so many things and good leadership should unite people around a common vision. But right now what we're experiencing is polarization and pulling. And while it's happening in the American culture, honestly, I think it's been happening in the American church and in the church for a long time. I mean, I'm always amazed when someone walks up to me and they're like, that service was amazing. Like I felt the Holy Spirit in that service, but what's your belief statement on this issue? And what that usually means is that someone is deciding whether or not they'll be connected with this group of believers based upon some secondary 
idea or belief. And while I think that it matters what we believe about things, I wonder sometimes how will we ever become united like these people in the scripture? You know what united these people who were in this room? They had experienced the resurrected Jesus. They were unified around that. They came from different backgrounds. They came from different histories. They, we see in scripture they had different ideas about how things should go. But they were united. And my friends, I really believe that one of the things that is pivotal in the movement of the Holy Spirit is a united church. It says when they were, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. That despite all of their backgrounds, despite all of their history, they were in a place together. And they weren't split up and all over the place. They were together. And the thing that unified them wasn't their history and it wasn't their background. It wasn't even their opinions. It was the resurrection of Jesus. And I believe we're in a day and an era where we need to find a place to unify around. And if we want to experience the Holy Spirit in a powerful way, we have to be willing to unify around something. And we might have statements about how much water we use to baptize people. And we might have statements about how all kinds of things can happen. But the reality is these people were unified. And I'm just going to tell you, getting religious people together to unify about anything is very difficult. But finding believers who believe in the resurrection of Christ, who will get together and work together, that's amazing. In this moment, there's this incredible unity that happens. They were together to celebrate something historically of when the law of God had come down to the character of Moses. Now, Moses had gone up into the mountains and he had received the law of God in the Old Testament. And when he came back down, he found that the people had created their own God, that they had created a idol that they were worshiping. And 3,000 people died the day that Moses brought the law down. The law pointed out that people did not add up to the standard of God. And when the law came down, it found that the people were lacking and 3,000 people died. I'm going to tell you, in the world that we live in, we live in a world where people are dying far from God. And there is a spiritual battle that has been raging. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, he offered hope for people. He offered change for people. But there's a spiritual battle occurring and Satan drastically wants to win and pull people away from God to bring disunity into the church, to bring division into the church. But these people were united and they experienced the Holy Spirit in a cool way. You see, I believe Satan does not fear necessarily a big church, but he does fear a unified church. In our community, we're kind of known as a larger church, but I really want us and my hope and my prayer as somebody who wants to experience what it looks like to see the Holy Spirit move in a big way that we can become a church that's known for our unity. Now look, you and I, we probably could sit down over coffee and you might find that we don't believe everything exactly the same. That if I brought out my 75 point college theology test from seminary or my college theology paper about my exact belief, you might find one point in there that you're like, I don't know about this guy, so I'm not going to unite with him. And in the world we live in, that's exactly how Satan works his way in, is that he builds division. And that's why there are so many denominations of faith in Jesus, is that there's such division. You know, unity does not mean agreeing on everything. I've been married for... Uh, about 21 years, but I might be creating division by the fact that I don't state that I've been married for 21 years and five months. 
We don't exactly think the same about every single thing in our home. But we do have some things that we're just unified on. Like at the end of the day, we want the world to see Jesus in our family. We want God to be reflected in the way that we raise our children, in the way that we love people, in the way that we choose to generosity, in the way that we choose things. We're unified on that. I mean, my wife and I can't even agree on exactly how you brown hamburger in a skillet. But when it comes to Jesus, Jesus is the thing that unifies our family. The fact that in all of her personality, in all of my personality, in our children's personality, there's a God in heaven who loved us, who wants us to serve him, and we're unified in that. You see, unity doesn't mean on agreeing on everything. And I think that one of the major losses in our culture today is because we think, well, I saw what you posted on Facebook the other day, and I don't agree with you on that, so we can't possibly be friends. But actually, Jesus came into a culture that was incredibly divided, and he unified a group of people over his resurrection. The reason they got together in this room together, yes, it was to celebrate Pentecost in the remembering of the law coming down, but it was also to recognize it was these group of people who were doing that in light of the resurrection of Jesus, that he rose from the dead. People often ask me about our church and our core beliefs, and I do have a paper and a file that has the beliefs of Bethel Church. And I often find religious people often want to know what those look like before they commit to be unified with us as believers. And I, and I, don't, I don't fault that. But I often want to just say, I don't think Jesus came, died on the cross, and rose from the dead in order to make all of this muddy. I think Jesus came He died on the cross and rose from the dead to actually unify the people who would believe in him and trust in him in some common things. And while many organizations can have so many core beliefs, I really think you can level down into three that we could probably all agree on. The first is, I'm messed up. I mean, you didn't look in the mirror this morning and be like, look at me, I'm awesome, I understand everything. You you didn't watch this video today because you thought, oh, I have the purest and most perfect godlike understanding of all things. You probably chose to watch this video today because you're pretty confident that you don't know everything and you really need to hear from God. You, You may know, and listen, you may know that you're messed up, that you don't have it all together. Can we all unite around the fact that There is a level of brokenness in our life that occurs because of the world that we live in. I don't know about you, but I can openly admit it. My name is Nathan, and I'm messed up. I read this quote this week, and I loved it so much that I wanted to share it with you. It was actually on a church's website, and I thought it was cool, so I wanted to share it with you. And I don't know who wrote it. I don't know if the author was actually the guy who put it on his church website or what, but it said this, and I think you'll relate to this. I'm a mess. On my own, I'm powerless over my own ego. My life is unmanageable, and I need God. Left to myself, I'll waste my one and only life in stupid ways. Do you relate to that? I'll damage and neglect important relationships. I'll make idols of success and my reputation. I'll use words where I'm supposed to use for God, and I'll deceive people. I'll use people for my own advancement when I'm supposed to serve the church. I'll serve myself instead of serving others instead of serving you. Greed could rule my wallet, and resentment will fill my heart in a nanosecond. Pride will govern my choices and selfishness will dominate my life. Left to myself, I'll spend a pathetic existence trying to polish my outer image and hide so no one will see an egocentric center that I am on the inside. Most of us know that our greatest regrets and our deepest uh, wishes for change were when we were left to ourselves. We are in the state that we're in because we were left to ourselves. 
It's not that hard to acknowledge that we're sinners and that if successful in our own will and our own attempts, we'll go to the grave just a respectable fraud. Can we unite around the fact that we're a little jacked up and messed up? You see, the people who were meeting in this room, they had come to the conclusion that Jesus had risen from the dead and that they really needed that to happen. Because the religious systems in their day were confidently telling them that they weren't good enough. And they knew it was true, but knowing that was true didn't help anything. And so they united around the fact that they knew they were messed up. They united around the fact that Jesus had brought them all together. All the messed up people, the religiously messed up, the morally messed up, that they needed Jesus. Can we unite as a church, maybe not about 55 statements of theological belief, but can we line it down to the fact that we're messed up and we need Jesus? See, these people had experienced a Friday where the world killed the one good thing for its own selfish pleasure. They knew the world was messed up. They knew they were part of the problem and they knew that they needed the death and resurrection of this Jesus to do anything. So I'm messed up. I need Jesus and Jesus is alive. See, knowing I'm messed up really doesn't help anything. Most of us know that already. Knowing that we need somebody to help us or need us to save us, we've all felt that moment where we're like, I really need help. Most of us find it way harder to believe someone would actually help us than to know that we need the help. But the thing that really brought these people together wasn't their historical background or what they were taught in religious classes. It was that a guy who was dead on Friday died for their sins to, and came back from the dead to pay the price they could not pay to actually provide the help they needed because he was alive. The reason they gathered together was that they had seen him dead on Friday and they had heard the good news that he lived on Sunday. It was what brought them together. And while they remembered the law coming down, they were remembering the Son of God coming down. So they experienced an incredible unity in those things. I promise you, church, if we'll focus on those things that really matter and unify around them, we might not agree politically on everything. We might not agree philosophically on everything, but we could experience an incredible amount of power. See, the early church experienced crazy power. And where the Spirit of God is, there is power. We can see this not just in the resurrection and the Pentecost where the Holy Spirit came down on the followers of Jesus. We see it even in the, in the Old Testament. Acts chapter 2 verse 2 in the New Testament says, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Meaning they were inside an enclosed room and felt such an incredible power in the middle of their unified gathering. They felt and experienced something that was clearly powerful. Where the Holy Spirit is moving, where the people are unified, there is power like nothing else. In the Old Testament, you, there's a story of a guy named Samson who was a judge, not in the way that we understand judges, but he was a, 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 a warrior in, in the behalf of God's people. And he was a young man and he was known for an extreme power. And it says as, Salmon, as Samson and his parents were going to Timnah, a young lion stepped out and attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. Now, I've got young boys in my home. They're not prepared for a lion. But it says at that moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. See, Samson was in a precarious situation. 
But the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. What we hear in the story of Pentecost is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God coming upon the people in a way that is far more powerful than what they were capable of their own, on their own. And I love this story. It says it kind of flippantly, but it says he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat. See, the Bible is actually pretty funny. You ever rip a goat's jaw apart? Yeah, me either. Not sure I got the strength for that. But Samson apparently had been practicing. In reality, what you hear here is that there's a moment in which a servant who God has chosen is empowered by the Spirit of God and given strength better than, than what he could have done on his own. He ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. As easily as if it was a young goat, there was power. In 1 Peter chapter 5, 8, the scripture says, Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You need to understand, if you have been one of those people gathered in the unity of a Christ who rose from the dead, that there is an evil presence, a, a Satan that wants to devour you, that to attack you. The Holy Spirit comes upon a unified people to give them the strength to withstand the attack that is stronger than them. The early church was filled with an incredible amount of power. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the Apostle Paul says it like this, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He'll give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living with you. The early church was known by the presence of a Holy Spirit that gave it a greater power. When, when the world describes the happenings at Bethel, the happenings of the people of God connected to Bethel, I hope it is not based upon the talent or strength of us, but on the presence of the Holy Spirit who gives a power that is greater than us. Are we stepping into a life that is of our power or one that is of God's power? The early church and the Holy Spirit and a church known for being connected with the Holy Spirit it was known for its unity, but it was also known for its power. It was known for its gifting. In verse 3 of Acts chapter 2, it says, Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Now when you read that, you hear fire and wind. There was wind in the room, like the power of a powerful wind, and there was fire. Do you know what happens when you combine wind and fire? You have something that is incontrollable. Forest fires often begin with a small spark or a, a cigarette thrown off to the side or a small spark. But when you combine that with the winds that can roll through the west, you can get an uncontrollable forest fire. What happened in the early church was something that was nearly uncontrollable. And what they experienced in Acts chapter 2 at the presence of the Holy Spirit was something that everyone would have understood was uncontrollable. In a dry climate, if you get flames and you get wind, you have something that is uncontrollable and incredibly powerful. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. We're given a gift because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us and our belief in God, our belief in, the, in Jesus Christ's resurrection that gives us an incredible power to overcome all that would come our way. Here's a question for you. Because in my own life, I often ask, often ask and often wonder, like, what? so what's my gift? I mean, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and he's alive. What's my gift? Here's a question I have for you. What do you enjoy 
and do well. And some people will tell you, you have to be miserable in order to follow Jesus, that you, you have to. And, and I do believe that sometimes God calls us to sacrifice, but so many people, have you ever watched people try to follow Jesus and seem utterly miserable? I really believe that Jesus gives us a gift that we're wired for and made for. And when we enjoy it and we do well at it, it's often the gift that God has given us. And those things don't always go together. Sometimes the things that we're maybe love to do may not be the things we're gifted to do. I mean, the Bible does say make a joyful noise, but let's be honest, pigs are pretty happy when they squeak and oink around the food that they're fed. Our gifting, God gives us a gift and his gifting is an empowered gift that gives us the power to do something beyond ourselves. And I believe it also is a gift that gives us joy. We feel alive when we operate in the giftedness of the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons why so many people don't see Jesus when they look as the church is they see people who seem to be miserable doing the things that they claim to be gifted at. Another thing that I see in this passage is that they weren't just gifted. They weren't just, they, they, they weren't just experiencing extra power and they weren't just experiencing the, the they weren't just experiencing God they they also were empowered to do what they couldn't do on their own they were enabled to do things beyond themselves in Acts chapter 2 verse 4 it says and everyone present was filled with the holy spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Listen, I took five years of French. There's a term in French for like American English. It's called franglais. I can't even speak the mix of French English called franglais. I speak redneck French. My professor told me that in my fifth year of French. And I was like, hey, I've taken five years of French. And he basically was telling me, you just... You just don't get it. You aren't enabled with this gift of understanding the French language. And while you may pass a college course, if you go to France, you better have a guide for your way. But everyone in this room was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to do what they couldn't do on their own. As the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. They were empowered. And you know what happens when you operate in your giftedness and empowered, you experience God. You cannot say, that was for me, I did that. In a church that's Holy Spirit fueled, you'll be left to find yourself saying, how on earth did that happen? With only one possible answer, the Holy Spirit presence of God. You know, it's interesting, they were celebrating on Pentecost when the law came down. In Exodus chapter 32, it tells about the original reason to celebrate that the Levites did what Moses commanded. They came down, brought the law, and Moses found that the people were being disobedient and 3,000 people died that day because of their disobedience to God. The law came down, people died. But on the day of Pentecost, where they were celebrating the coming down of the law, now as believers in Christ, the law came down and people died. But then when the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost, 3,000 people came to Jesus and were given life. You see, the law gave death, Christ gave life. Those who accepted Paul's message were baptized and about 3,000 people were added to their number. That day the Holy Spirit came down and 3,000 people we're saved. We live in a world today that drastically needs to see the Holy Spirit move. Because when it sees, when the faulted people move and act on their own behalf outside of the Spirit of God, people die. But when God's people, fully devoted to Him, act in the Holy Spirit, life comes. Do you know that Jesus? who promised and sent the Holy Spirit to live in those who believe in Him. You'll live an empowered life if you follow Him. 
Maybe your next step today is to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Despite the fact that you're messed up, to say, I need you, Jesus, and I believe that you're alive, would you give me your Holy Spirit in my life to guide me, to empower me, to strengthen me in a powerful way? God, would you give our church the ability to be empowered in an amazing way, not so that our ability would be seen, but so that Jesus would be seen? Maybe your step today is to just simply say, Holy Spirit, Help me to be prepared for the gifting that you would give me and help me to be prepared to be wholly devoted to you. Can we be a unified, powerful, gifted, and enabled church? Not by our own strength, but by the strength of the Holy Spirit. See, I would love to experience what it was like to be in the room that day. But I really believe that we can. Would you unify around other people who are unified in the resurrection of Jesus and experience the Holy Spirit? in a powerful way. I love you, Bethel. Have a great week. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Are you ready to take your next step? We would love to hear from you. You can send an email to hello at Bethel.us. You can send us a message on Facebook, or you can let us know in the Bethel app. And speaking of the Bethel app, take a moment, if you haven't already, to go to your app store and search Bethel Putco to download our app. There's all kinds of great resources in the app. You can listen to messages, you can view the messages for Sunday morning, and you can also fill out a digital connect card. You can do that today and each week to let us know that you're tuning in. You can also find some great information about our Bethel Kids Ministry and our Be The One Student Ministries. Also in the app, you can give. It's one of three ways you can give. With online giving at Bethel.us slash give in our app, Bethel Putco, or through text. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great day and know that you are loved.